So today, hopefully our field team caught a ton of awesome critters, uh, definitely some fish if uh, we were lucky enough, but we use this as a tool to identify some of the anatomy and the uh, some of the adaptations that fish have. And even if you don't know the name or the species of what you're looking at, a tool like this is a real treat because you can go through it and figure out some of the things maybe about what it eats, uh, how it lives, how it swims, where it lives, um, all those cool features that could lead you to an identification down the road. So uh, our field team will be looking at the body shape and the fin shape, specifically the caudal fin shape today of some of our fish. And that tells us kind of how it swims, if it's fast, if it's slow, how it predates on other animals. Also the mouth shape is gonna be really important. Um, that's gonna tell you how it hunts for its food. So depending on what fish we caught, we might see a variety of different jaws. Also camouflage is so important. That's such a great adaptation that fish use, but that's an indicator for us, for let's say an, a fish that has reflective scales, that'll tell us it's a schooling fish. And that'll lead us into uh, some more identification tools. But some fish have cryptic coloration and even disruptive coloration. And we might be lucky enough to see that today. And some fish are just out of the box, odd shaped, have some crazy adaptations, crazy uh, features on their body that really allow us to see kind of the, uh, the outlier uh, adaptations that they have. And things like big eyes and modified fins are kind of a dead giveaway. Uh, and those make it a little bit easier to identify those uh, fish species. So now that you got kind of acclimated with your terminology and we will be ready to hear from our field team in just a minute, we want to show you the method of how our field team caught these animals because it's pretty special and it takes a lot of practice. So let me pull up my video here. As you're pulling it up, I wanted to mention to everyone that you can use the chat box to communicate with us. You can click the all panelists if you want to tell us you're having some kind of technical difficulty, or if you have something for the whole group, you can use the panelists and attendees. There's also a Q&A box on the toolbar at the bottom. So in this webinar format, we can't see you and we can't hear you, but we know that you're out there. And so we want you to be able to communicate with us with your questions. So if you have a question, you can add it to that Q&A box and our team will be able to answer it towards the end of the presentation. All right, go ahead with the video, Morgan. All right, so it is so special to share with you all how we were able to catch all these cool critters for you all to see today. We have a very special boat called a mullet skiff. And what you're looking at here is not our particular mullet skiff. Uh, this is a video from our fisheries biologist when we went out with him uh, in a different area not within the reserve, but it just shows great use of the particular boat and the net that we use. So this mullet skiff, you notice there's no engine on the back. What the heck is up with that? Well, the engine's in the front, so we can deploy a net, an otter trawl net off the back. So here you're seeing the gear. This net is large. It has two doors on either side that when you deploy it off the back of the, the boat, it pushes the net open. There's going to be floats on the top and leads on the bottom. So it's like one big mouth and it's got a tickle chain that allows you to tickle up all the cool critters. So here you're seeing us deploying the net. You can see those floats on the top. There is a buoy at the very end, so we don't lose sight of our net. But once it's fully deployed, we'll set it for about three to five minutes. Our fisheries biologist does 10, I believe, but for us, we just do uh, half that. We don't, we don't go through all the trouble. But when we bring it on board, it's really fun because that's when we get to sort. So we sort looking for the different organisms, some of the bycatch, and we're gonna record all of that. Um, and I'm sure our ed team already put that in today. So here's us retrieving the net. You can see, oh man, sometimes the catch is just so big. You gotta heave it on board. And at the end of that net, there's a bag that collects all of the organisms that we caught. And that is what we would empty out onto the vessel and then sort through. And that's what you're gonna see right now with our field team. So as long as they are ready for us, I believe we can transfer over to them. Well, as soon as the field team turns on their camera, they will magically appear on your screen and we'll be able to see what they're seeing. Oh my gosh, here it comes. Wait for it. All right. Though. 
No, okay. Can you hear us okay? Yep. Take it away. Oh, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for our patience. You know, this technological world, there's always surprise. Um, so many things at Dita, other people to kind of share with you what we got. Um, your sound quality is not that great and you're frozen, but go ahead and continue. We can't wait to see your animals. All right, can you see my next? Uh, yep. My teammate, all right. Hi, everybody. My name is Janine, and I'm part of the education team here to show you um, what we caught today. So uh, we're really excited. Oh, hey, everybody. My name's Sarah. I'm on the research team here at the reserve, uh, helping out and excited for this uh, excursion. Cool. All right, let's dive in and get wet. So, Dita, yeah. we can hear the wind a little bit. So tell us about your weather, but as you get closer to the person talking, we can hear better. Perfect. So it is a little bit windy, but it's very quickly warming up, which is very, very, very exciting. And we have um, a, some pretty interesting catches, um, kind of some hidden treasures, you can say. So Janine, who is this big guy who is in this bin? Oh, right, let's see. We're going to. Or what is he? He looks kind yeah. of bad. Woo! So we, we do have um, a larger fish that we caught today, and that's because we were trawling in an area that was actually pretty deep. Um, so that, depending on what area we trawl in, the depth, um, how close it is to our mangroves, you know, we're really gonna capture different species. Um, so right here, hopefully this view is good. Everybody can get a nice look. This wow. is uh, Morgan mentioned, um, you know, about some of their physical features that help to tell us about the fish. Uh, we can already see that this fish, wow, look at the display of these really um, fun, this uh, dorsal fins here. So I'm sure you can tell, and the fact that I'm wearing gloves might also help you understand <laughs> that they are very spiny, right? So that's going to be great mechanism for defense. All right. And this fish is going to need it because this is a food fish. All right, not only myself, maybe Sarah and Dita like to eat this fish, but uh, larger fish are gonna go after it as it's, you know, in its younger stages. This one around here. Another thing that is just so noticeable about this fish kind of stands out here in our bin is its coloration. Those are stripes, right? You know, that's what a lot of people call them, but we refer to them actually in the fish community as bars. So if they are vertical, you're going to call them bars. If they're horizontal, you're going to call them stripes. Very cool. And yeah, so this disruptive coloration here with the bars is going to be great to handle bars for this fish. And when you're close enough to it, there is something else very interesting about this fish. That tells us a lot of maybe what it can eat. Woo! Give them right. a break for a second. <laughs> so this fish has um, what we call a terminal mouth. All right, so it's in the very front of its head. And it actually has some really interesting teeth. I don't know if we can see these champas. I right hear we're lagging just a little bit, so we'll hold it still. Yeah, Janine, we can definitely see the mouth. We're not able to see the details inside. Do you want to describe? Yeah. It? So the lower jaw um, is covered, and really the whole front area of its mouth is covered in these teeth. And um, that is because this fish loves to chomp and chew on a variety of uh, crustaceans or uh, like barnacles, um, crabs. Um, and then, you know, young fish, but it will go into the oyster beds. You're really going to have a good chance of finding it there or around the dock. Um, so getting all that fouling that's on uh, oysters and on your docks. Uh, so for anybody who uh, maybe took a guess at what this fish is, I'm not sure if they're using the chat 
Um, but this fish is a uh, sheep's head. One of my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> you have patience for them stealing your bait. And yeah. speaking of bait, I think we have another wonderful friend in there. Yeah, let me get my net because uh, I'm going to get my smaller net. And we have caught um, a variety of sizes of sheep's head, right, Dita? I mean, from the tiniest little uh, size of a quarter to um, even a little bit bigger than that. Okay. But we, again, we were trawling in an area where it was a little deeper. Okay, can everybody see? What a size difference, field cam. <laughs> Yeah, we're talking about an inch, just beyond an inch here. And I know we lost a little bit of our sunlight, um, but this fish is uh, changing color. Um, whoop, jumped right out of my hand. Safely in the water though. So this fish is a common bait fish. Um, you're gonna find it, you know, tucked away maybe in our, near our mangrove roots and shallow open water. Um, you can get some of its coloration here. It does have a little disturbed pattern. Actually, there's some bars coming out. And fish is not showing the distinguishing feature of where it gets its name, which, um, oh, oh, it almost flashed its eye, right? It looks like he has two. Oh, yeah, so right. Whew, that's a little hard to see there. So that could be a good way to uh, identify it, um, right? Mm -hmm. Because, well, coloration isn't always going to be best. So you want to look hey, Field Cam, we've lost your audio just a little bit. Characteristics look a lot different than, you know, Okay, I'm just gonna mute it for a second and we'll just look, um, <laughs> catch this fish, let them relax and then we'll come right. Great, so the field cam is just gonna give their audio a second to adjust, but the fish we just saw was called a pin fish. And the way I always remember it because there's pig fish and pin fish, I always remember that the pin fish, like the field team pointed out, has that dot, all right? They just pointed it out on the side of its body. So that's how I always remember. It looks like a pinhead. So that's a great way to identify it. But like Dita just said, coloration is not the way to go when identifying fish. Uh, they change so quick and so frequently. And can you hear us? Oh, you're back, yes. Okay, I'm gonna release our sheep's head because it is, you know, getting a little stressed out here. So one sec. Oh my. All right, so safe and sound. We actually caught a couple. One was a little bigger, but I um, wanted to just just have one for you. All right, so, um, you know, every trawl is different. And sometimes we get a lot of one thing, sometimes we get a lot of several things, and sometimes we don't get a whole lot. So we, that's all we got for fish today. This is not a lie. And, um, but what we did get, which is really cool, um, are a variety of other habitats. Uh, so um, that pinfish, you know, sometimes they're really uh, abundant in areas like seagrass beds, which we weren't trawling over. We were trawling over some muddy bottom, um, but there happened to be oyster clusters and sponge in that muddy bottom that we picked up. And uh, that's where we ended up getting a lot of invertebrates because of these other habitats that were down there. So let's check out those habitats. Um, it's kind of a surprise uh, find for us today. And these habitats, um, even though we're on muddy bottom, this really did help for all those lovely invertebrates you mentioned. Yes. So let's start out with our um, oyster clusters. Now, these aren't alive. Okay, by any means, but they came off of a bigger bar that was nearby, um, and they are structure for all kinds of other organisms. So actually, that pinfish was hiding right in the nook of one of these oyster shells when we picked it.
it up in the trawl. And it's probably hard to make out, but on here, there are a variety of sponge. There, is, we've got, um, oh, these amazing tube worms. There's one right here that I'm pointing to. Uh, it's of course hidden because it's out of the water, but uh, these shells, um, remaining shells of dead oysters are extremely valuable structure for any type of fowling community that we have. So, um, uh, you know, we're gonna, um, just toss those over. But again, um, we wouldn't have probably found, like Dita said, the sheep's head um, or all the inverts that we have to show you if that wasn't down there. So we did get some sponge and let's see if we can get better lighting. It's just not ideal. Here we go. How's this? Okay. So the, we have so many cool different sponge here. And this is an ancient animal, y'all. I don't know if you realize this, but sponge are animals and they, um, they're filter feeders, right? They have, um, they're in their own group and they literally just bring in the water and they filter it out for uh, food particles, uh, oxygen, and then they uh, just spit water right back out. And they become an amazing habitat for worms, for oh. Oh, a little baby pistol <laughs> shrimp. Oh my gosh, right there, that translucent thing. That's a little shrimp. And we actually have a bigger version of that we're gonna show you in just a minute. So you might think, oh my gosh, what is she doing? She just told us this is alive. Um, this is an animal, she's ripping it apart, but um, they can regenerate. So sponges have been around for a long, long time. And uh, they're really resilient actually. Scientists think that, you know, these are the animals that are gonna beat climate change or, you know, any, um, negative impacts that may, may come of that because they have survived, uh, you know, since before the dinosaurs. So been through a lot. So this is just one type of sponge we get. And we saw the pistol shrimp in there. So let me just show you the uh, bigger version of that because it's just too good to pass up. Um, maybe you wanna come up, Data. Let you. Does that look? He looks kind of like a crayfish. Oh my goodness. It's a little bit pixelated on our end. Oh, okay. It's like an artistic rendition. <laughs> um, it says that you're right, we'll hopefully give it a little bit of time. Can you describe it? I can see it. So a lot of times people do say that looks like a lobster or a crayfish. And that's because it has a um, claw. And this claw is what gives it its name, pistol shrimp, because that larger claw, when it actually cocks back, um, uh, when it makes the motion, um, when it cocks back its pincer, um, like a pistol. And when that bubble pops, it creates light. It creates heat, like the surface of the sun level heat. And that is how it not only can defend itself, but it will capture its prey. It literally stuns its prey and then can be uh, take advantage of that stunned prey item and go and secure it for a nice meal. How is um, everybody able to see and hear? be described as beautiful creature we just missed the part about the cavitation bubble so oh man the coolest part you can uh re, re uh yeah kind of so remember what i said morgan so audience uh if your audio went out during that really cool description uh this pistol shrimp has an accentuated claw and that's how it got its name that's what janine just told us it cocks its pincher back and creates this air bubble. That's what's called a cavitation bubble. And when it pops it, it creates heat and light and sound and you hear it. Even if you don't know you caught a pistol shrimp because it's so well camouflaged, you can hear it snapping every now and again. It uses it to stun its prey and uh, uses it for kind of defensive purposes to say, hey, listen, you're in my space. So that's pretty cool that you guys caught one and were able to find it. I mean, I feel like they're so hard to get a hold of. Oh, new critter. 
Oh, Felkin, what are we looking at? Uh, we're good to go. So these guys are adorable. And we brought you a range of sizes that we found. So this we found amongst our oyster clusters and our sponge. And this friends is a stone crab, um, still quite young, but we did like Dita said, get quite a few different sizes. And hopefully you can notice, oh my gosh, we got some really, um, some super babies, right? We basically went over the area for Morgan, I'm having trouble hearing them. Can you describe what we're looking at? Crabs here. And yeah. these oh. are much, better, these younger ones, black and white bands on the back. Do you want to take over stone crabs and then we'll show you our next critter after that as well. Sure. So uh, for our audience listening, uh, if you didn't hear all that came through, we are looking at a stone crab. And Janine just told us they found it amongst the oysters. And these stone crabs have really powerful pinchers uh, and they can actually eat the oysters. So when we used to do uh, these labs with students, we would keep oysters in these bins. And man, these stone crabs would just demolish them. But like Janine said, you can see the black barring or the bands uh, on the back of its legs. That's how you can tell uh, it's a stone crab, even at that small size. Oh, and it can fit right in the palm of their hand. It's so cute. Awesome. All right. What is this last critter that we are going to observe? can't even see. Well, that's why. Oh my gosh. Well, audience, if you can't see like I can, <laughs> it's because this particular animal, this invertebrate is nearly translucent. Uh, they are holding in this jar a comb jelly. Oh, very cool. And what's really fun, um, just speaking about comb jellies, they're not true jellyfish. They're in a group called tinafores, but we can talk about that and another finding fish. We can get in a little bit deeper, but depending on the water conditions and just the temperature, uh, you can see tons of these comb jellies and they're actually considered plankton. So when people think a lot about plankton, they think, oh, it's microscopic, but not always. Uh, these animals will drift through the water, kind of being subjected to anything that goes, whether it's the tide, current, the wind, um, and they just go wherever the water takes them but they are really, really cool. All right, field team, I believe uh, I can show just a few other animals that we might get in a trawl um, if you don't have anything else to show us. We have one, we'll see if we can find, but we'll let you know when we find it. it was, it's probably our hidden treasure of the morning. Cool. Oh my gosh. Well, that sounds great. Okay. So what I'm going to do for everyone is share my screen one more time to that video I pulled up in the beginning of us doing a trawl in a different area, but it's so cool because you can see all of the different animals that we could potentially catch. So check this out. This right here is a pipe fish. It's a relative to the seahorses. And the last time we did a finding fish, if you all joined us, we actually got two pipefish of the same species. We got gulf pipefish in our last trawl, but this one is humongous. Oh, now check this out. This is a brief squid, pretty good size too. And this actually belongs to a group called cephalopods and it's in the mollusk family. So it's related to things like snails and even our oysters that we just saw on our trawl today. It's a big, big group. They'd look a lot different. Oh, and then this is a crowd favorite. I don't know if you all joined us for our last one, but this is our golf toadfish or what I like to call the oyster crusher. And I'm sure you're all noticing this crazy looking flatfish. 
Oh my gosh. I just love these fish. This is called the tongue fish. And it's got that crazy dorsal compression. It's such a crazy looking fish. And again, as a flat fish, it does really well on the bottom, blending into the, the muddy or the sandy bottom, settles in, and then it kind of just waits on its prey. Oh, I just love the tongue fish. And if you've ever tried to grab a tongue fish, you know it's just as slippery as a tongue. We see some nudibranchs, some ragged sea hares, some common bait fish. This here is a really large whiting. Oh, some more awesome invertebrates. We see brittle stars a lot, depending on where we trawl. These belong to a group called echinoderms, so they're related to our sea stars. Oh, another flatfish. I'm surprised we didn't get one today, but again, it all depends on the substrate. Oh, and oh my gosh, audience, if you've ever seen a seahorse in person, it is just the coolest thing. Uh, we would find a seahorse often if we're trawling along seagrass. Uh, that's where those pipefish, as well as the seahorse, typically like to hang out. Oh, and our gobies. Those are a benthic fish. Oh, and in this particular trawl, I know there's a couple species of mantis shrimp, but we do get one here in Southwest Florida, just not so much uh, in our estuary where we trawl today. All right. Oh, and then of course the blue crab. So these are all species that we could see uh, on the trawls going forward in this series. So if you didn't see something you particularly wanted to, don't fret. Uh, we will be back for the next two months uh, doing a finding fish for you all. So like Janine said, it's always different. And I think they have one more special animal to show us if they were happy to find it. What are we looking at, Field Cam? It's a warty shorty. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, yes. we've seen like three of these ever in the reserve. That is so cool. That's a special tribute to one of our past staff members. Uh, this happened to be their favorite uh, find in a trawl. Wow. How special. Details? So yeah, this is one of our sea slugs. It's in the mollusk group. So this is related to our sea hare, or you know, new to Bronx, um, you know, clams, uh, oysters, snails. It's in that same group. Sorry, it's a little, there we go. Um, but yeah, this just this one's really tiny. They can get um, like four, four or five inches. I've seen them. But yeah, very rare find. I haven't seen one in years. So that was really exciting. Oh, that is so great. It just goes to show, uh, depending on the conditions, depending on where you trawl, how often you trawl, uh, your catch is always so different, which makes it really fun and a great learning experience. So field team, if you don't have anything else for us, I believe we are ready to take a couple questions. Don't forget to add them to the Q&A box. We're gonna start um, asking the questions that are in there. Um, but I have one for Morgan before we get there. So it'll give you an extra second to type your question in. Morgan, I know the field team keeps using all these big science words like invertebrate. What does that mean exactly? That's a great question, Sarah. So uh, an invertebrate just means it's an animal without a backbone. So us humans, nope, we would not classify. We've got a backbone. Um, but these animals are abundant. And you saw just how different they can all look. We saw the warty doherty. We saw the oysters. And just because they don't have a backbone doesn't mean they don't have adaptations for structure. So an oyster, although no backbone, it has a hard shell to protect its soft body. And a snail, same thing. And some of these uh, other invertebrates, like we saw the brief squid in the video, they might have internal shells or an adaptation that allows them to have some sort of structure or protection. So that's what we mean by invertebrates, so no backbone. Thank you for clarifying that, appreciate it. Morgan, I'll open up the Q&A box if you want sure. to type in the name of our last fish. I know it's called Warty Doherty, but I honestly have no idea how to spell that. So I'm gonna leave that sure. to you. So it's okay. easier to say, and maybe it's easy to spell, but I'll open up the Q&A box if you can type in um, fish number three there. 
Um, okay, so Amy asked a question about how deep is deep to us at Rookery Bay? And I can go ahead and answer this as Morgan is typing in. So I think that is such a good question because depending on where you are, um, deep may have a totally different definition. So here in our estuary, some places are so shallow that the boat can't go. And our deepest spot is actually a um, limestone karst, which means that it's kind of like a, a sinkhole in the ground. And that's at 20 feet. So where the team was trawling today, I would guess that deep is probably six feet. So it's kind of water that if you were to fall overboard, chances are you could stand up although your feet would probably sink in the mud. So it's, um, it's pretty shallow in our bays, which is you know kind of an interesting thing. We can get a really high salinity environment because the water, fresh water will evaporate and leave behind a lot of salt. And then because there's not a lot of water, it can get really, really salty in some areas, which is a, a neat local phenomenon. So that's a really good question. Okay, um, let's see, what else should we answer, Morgan? So there, there was a question actually that came through in the chat box to me. Uh, we had a participant who wants to know, how often do we trawl? Because we talked a lot about uh, our fisheries biologists. They do that for research. But as an education team, how often do we trawl? Field cam, are you there? Yep, we're here. Okay. Um, it depends. So for... This program, we are trawling once a month, uh, which is always exciting, but we do try to go at least two times a month just to keep our, you know, our skills up and just to kind of monitor what's in the area. In a uh, regular school season, we do have uh, our high school program and with our college students, we'll actually take them out on the boats and do trawls. So in school season, we may do more trawls than that. Awesome. And I believe we have time for one more question before we wrap it up with you all. Uh, we had someone ask, and Field Cam, you can tune in too, but they were wondering, across the education team, uh, what is your favorite animal that you've ever caught in a trawl? Sarah, do you want to tell us yours, and then we'll, we'll transfer to the field team? Yes. Yes, absolutely. So I love the polka dot batfish. And if you're not familiar, it is the mascot of Rookery Bay. And it's because it is an endemic fish. Now there are batfish that live all around the world, but the polka dot batfish only lives in Southwest Florida. So it's this really weird fish and we actually catch it pretty often. So I hope that you'll join us for a future excursion where we're finding fish, because I bet you that we're going to see one. If not, I can tell you a secret that if you go to our excursion webpage, there is a video from our previous programs and there are some bat fish in there. Ooh, you're going to get people watching our videos. That's awesome. <laughs> My go-to is the Florida horse. Uh, I love that. It's a, it's the apex predator of the snail world. Uh, and that particular snail can get up to just about two feet long, uh, maybe even a little over, which is crazy to think about. Um, so we love to find them and it's the state shell of Florida. So how could you not love it? Um, Field Cam, can you finish us out with some of your favorite animals you've caught on our trawls? So we'll just do it quick. I'd have to say mine is a little, a juvenile burfish because they look like little black blobs with yellow spots. And yours, Janine? Well, I think mine is any of those uh, little new to Bronx that we get. I, I always get the most excited. Um, so like that warty dorty as so a, a sea slug or a new to Bronx. That's amazing. Well, Field Cam, thank you so much for uh, showing us all the cool critters that you found, whether they were fish or invertebrates. We so appreciate you getting out in the field and taking us with you. It was so much fun. Morgan, I'm going to pull up a map of where they were so we can orient everyone one more time. So I'm just going to um, make sure that you can see the field camera as well as us. Um, 
Okay, spotlighting Morgan. Okay, here we are. So on this map, where the team was, if you can see my mouse, they were in this area here. So Rookery Bay proper, or the bay at which our reserve was named, is right in here. And they were in that approximate area. So I just wanted to tell you that we're not done. There's so much more that we have to offer. So for today, we're wrapping up, but we have a whole bunch more excursions and we're just now planning our summer. So we hope to see you for another Finding Fish or our uh, other topics that we're covering. On March 26, we will have a Changing Shorelines. Then in April, we're gonna feature Fire and in May, Native Biodiversity of the Reserve. Additionally, we have a camp out happening. And so even though the Environmental Learning Center is closed with no timeline for reopening at this time, we got special permission to host a family camp out out on the grounds of the Environmental Learning Center. So you can see the picture there on the right. We're gonna have tent camping. It's gonna be so awesome. And it's kind of a learn how to set up a tent and begin camping lesson. So we're really excited for that. And that happens later this month. In the meantime, we have all kinds of kayak tours and boat tours. We have a class called Virtual Binoculars where we teach you how to identify birds while you're at home and we're out at the beach. And we also have online photography classes. So go to our website, rookerybay.org. You can see our calendar there and you can sign up for all of our future events. And I just wanna thank everyone for participating today and um, bearing with us on our technical difficulties. And this program is recorded. So it will be on our website. Morgan, if you can drop that website into the chat box, it might be easier for them to see. It's rookerybay.org. And then there's actually a special link that takes you right to the excursion page where you can see the calendar of upcoming programs as well as the videos for this. And we'll have it posted by the end of the hour. So lastly, I, after thanking you for attending today, I just wanted to remind you that our programs can only get better, so we want your feedback. So as you click end on your slideshow today, you will see a survey pop up on your screen. We really, really value your feedback. So tell us what we did great, tell us which wasn't so great, and tell us your other ideas for future programs too. And thank you so much for participating. So signing off, we'll see you next time.